After years of seeing the same faces again and again, seeing two completely new party leaders this time is kind of refreshing. For this final election of the 60s, both candidates would attempt to use their status as fresh new faces to win over voters who were becoming increasingly weary of how stagnant politics had become. Nineteen sixty nine would mark almost twenty years of governance by the Liberal Country Coalition. By this point in history, a whole generation of Australians had grown up almost entirely under the governance of the coalition and had never experienced a Labour government. Hoping to capture the hearts and minds of these Australians would be the radical new leader of the Labour Party, <coughs> Whitlam. Oh, sorry. Goff Whitlam. Whitlam was a completely new type of Labour leader. Previous leaders had nearly all come from the workforce and unions. Whitlam, on the other hand, had come from a prestigious college and had only done six years of service in the Air Force before joining Parliament in 1952. Whitlam brought new insight to the Labour Party. Since the party's creation in 1901, the large working class that had been the backbone of the Labour voting base had become a prosperous middle class. These middle class citizens held much more liberal views and were far less supportive of the socialist ideals that had originally given birth to the Labour Party. Whitlam would attempt to modernise the Labour Party in an attempt to win over these middle class voters. His first move would be to wrestle control of the Labour Party's policy agenda away from the executive and unions and give it to the elected members of Parliament. He also brought about a much more progressive agenda than previous Labour leaders, promoting recognition of Aboriginal land rights as well as being more open to globalisation. Whitlam wasn't only running on policy. In Parliament, Whitlam would reorganise the Labour's front bench of ministers to form the first true Australian shadow cabinet. This would involve individual members of the opposition taking up shadow ministerial positions to oppose the equivalent government cabinet minister. This allowed the Labour Party to more effectively debate the government, and soon Labour was finding itself winning debates in Parliament, and for the first time since the Curtin years, the party began to look like a genuine alternative government. The resurgence of the Labour Party would put pressure on the coalition, led by Prime Minister Harold Holt. Despite winning a huge majority in the election of 1966, Holt was quickly finding himself in deep water. In Southeast Asia, the Vietnam War continued and Australian casualties began to rack up, which resulted in the anti-war movement gaining strength. Despite being a strong diplomat on the world stage, Holt was not an effective Prime Minister at home. His government was dredged in multiple controversies, including a fight with the ABC, something the Liberals had frequently gotten into, a mishandling of a military accident, as well as the misuse of government aircraft. Unlike his predecessor Menzies, Holt did not enforce a strong party discipline, and dissent began to bubble up within the party, with multiple members becoming very critical of the Prime Minister. This, combined with other controversies, led to the poor performance by the government in the 1967 Senate election, in which the coalition would lose two seats. This poor showing began to raise concerns that Holt was not going to win the upcoming 1969 election. Hoping to get away from the rapids of Canberra, Holt would travel to his holiday home in Portsea, Victoria in December 1967. While on holiday, Holt would stop by the remote Cheviot Beach with four of his companions to do some swimming, as Holt was an experienced swimmer and the day had been relatively hot. Upon arriving at the beach, all of Holt's companions, bar one Alan Stewart, would bail out from swimming due to the presence of strong swells in the ocean. Holt and Stewart would enter the water. However, upon feeling the strong undertoes, Stewart would remain in the shallows. Holt, on the other hand, continued to go further out to sea, where he would disappear beneath the waves and did not resurface. Stewart would immediately return to shore and would rush to the nearby army training facility, which the beach was part of, and would alert them to what had just happened. An hour later, the largest search operation in Australian history would begin, with divers and helicopters scouring the waters around Cheviot Beach in hopes of finding the Prime Minister. Unfortunately, by the evening, reality began to set in, and the rescue mission became a search for a corpse. However, no corpse was ever found, and Holt was never officially proclaimed dead. However, seeing as he'd be 111 today, we can quite confidently presume that he is no longer alive. In the same manner with Joseph Lyon's death, the country party leader would take over as Prime Minister until the Liberal Party could determine a new leader, and thus John McEwen would become the 18th Prime Minister on the 19th of December 1967. Born in 1900, McEwen would be the last Prime Minister older than the country he was representing. After a rough upbringing losing both his parents at a young age, McEwen would win the seat of Echuca in 1934, but would later move seats twice due to redistricting and would end up representing the seat of Murray. 
After 33 years in Parliament, the longest for any Australian politician, he had become Prime Minister at the age of 67, making him the oldest person to take the role of Prime Minister. While McEwen led the nation, the Liberal Party had to decide a new leader. The most obvious contender was Treasurer and Deputy Party Leader William McMahon. However, there was just one problem. McEwen hated McMahon, and would use his role as Country Party Leader and Prime Minister to force McMahon to withdraw his attempt. This left the door open for Senate Leader John Gorton to take on the role and he would become the 19th Prime Minister of Australia. Due to Westminster tradition, Gorton needed to be a member of the lower house to be Prime Minister. Luckily, one seat just so happened to be vacant, Higgins, the seat of former Prime Minister Harold Holt. Being a safe Liberal seat, Gorton won easily, despite not being able to vote for himself due to being enrolled in a different electorate. Due to having to resign from the Senate to run for the lower house, Gorton is the only Prime Minister to have been a Senator, a Member of Parliament, and for 21 days, between resigning and winning Higgins, a member of neither chamber. Gorton was an interesting Prime Minister, taking a very casual tone when talking, as can be seen in this video taken just after the Apollo 11 spacecraft had landed on the moon. Prime Minister, what are your impressions of today's great event? Well, they're many and varied, but I have a prepared formal statement, which I think perhaps I could read, because that would put in short compass uh, the general impressions that I have. And this is the statement. Uh, this, the first landing of man on the moon, is a success which excites the wonder and admiration of us all. This helped to make Gorton look like a man of the people, and led to him being initially very popular as Prime Minister. However, his style was criticised by some as sloppy and unbefitting of a national leader. As Prime Minister, Gorton would continue much of Holt's legacy, distancing Australia from its traditional British ties and instead focusing on the Pacific region. He was also a big fan of the arts and would move to establish an independent Australian film industry. Despite his initially positive reception, by the 25th of October 1969, Election Day, Gorton was not looking very strong in the polls. The Vietnam War can continue to become more and more unpopular, as footage came out showing the horrors that were occurring there. Gorton was also in favour of centralisation policies, which alienated him from powerful Liberal state leaders. He also began gaining a lot of enemies within his own party, who wanted him to post as leader. To make matters worse, his opponent for this election would be the formidable Gough Whitlam, who would run a very strong campaign, pushing for change and an end to two decades of Liberal rule. This election would see a new seat added in South Australia, bringing the total number of seats in Parliament up to 125. And the winner was... Despite a massive swing of over 7% towards the Labour Party, John Gorton and the Coalition would win with 66 seats, but with the loss of 16 seats, the party's majority had been crushed. Despite again losing the two party preferred, Gorton was able to hold on to four seats in Victoria with the help of the DLP. Despite helping the coalition retain power for a ninth time, the DLP's first preferences continued to drop, and with it, its prospects of keeping Labour out of office. With a gain of 18 seats, Whitlam had not only brought the Labour Party back from oblivion, he had also silenced his critics who were in favour of a more traditional Labour government. With 59 seats, Whitlam would continue to push his message that it's time for freedom. It's time for moving. It's time to begin. Yes, it's time. Come back next time for the election of 1972.